Hello, this is Dr. Dan Guerra, and today we're going to continue our arc of discussion on aging. Uh, so let's get started. Remember, I am from Verev Med, and we're going to get into um, some of the specifics about oxidation reactions and how that um, has a very direct impact on the aging process. So let's get started. Remember, we're Verev Med, and I'm Dan Guerra. All right. So I want to talk to you today about reactive oxygen. Some of you may find this a bit of a off-putting because some of the discussion is going to relate to some chemistry. And I know chemistry can be off-putting to some people, particular to biology people, uh, people who study biology, even medical doctors. But uh, this aspect of chemistry, I think, uh, if we go through it, will be very useful to understand what reactive oxygen is and how reactive oxygen can play a role in the aging process and indeed in a lot of biomedical uh, events. So this is a actually part four. This is lecture number four, if you're following this arc of lectures on aging. And it's going to be part one of series four. And so let's get started because we have a lot to talk about. All right, so what we're gonna to do today is discuss what are some of the biochemical mechanisms that help focus the physiological mechanisms of aging, okay? So we wanna get down to the nitty gritty biochemistry. For that, we have to get into this, some of the nitty gritty chemistry. Now, here's a progression of uh, photographs of Paul Newman, one of my favorite uh, actors who's now deceased. <clears throat> We can see how uh, Mr. Newman progressed from this high school picture over there on the left to probably when he was about 30, when he was making a movie like The Hustler, when he was a pool shark. Then maybe when he made The Color of Money, when he was like the uh, patron of a hustler of a pool shark. Uh, anyways, when he's probably in his late 50s or something like that, maybe 60. And then finally, probably when he was much older, uh, closer to when he uh, passed away. You can see that he's the same person. You can see the same blue eyes, at least in these color photographs. Uh, but you can see also that he's aged quite a bit. So we have no argument to say that when a person ages, they look quite different, yet fundamentally they're the same person. So what is involved in that aging process? It's just looking at his face, but we know there's a lot of endophenotypic change as well. So there has been a strong suggestion that reactive oxygen plays a role here. What's reactive oxygen? Shown here on the slide, remember that oxygen itself, uh, di-oxygen, uh, uh, that is O2, right? That's molecular oxygen or diatomic oxygen, that it can become partially reduced in nature. So it goes from O2, right, all the way to uh, OH uh, ion and ultimately to water, not shown here, so the ultimate, ultimate reduction of molecular oxygen is to water. But through that reduction process, we make a lot of reactive oxygen. Superoxide anion, the peroxide radical, which has two unpaired electrons, okay? Unpaired electrons make it a radical. There's one unpaired electron. Then hydrogen peroxide, we start introducing hydrogen ions to the system. Then the hydroxyl radical, which is the most potent oxidant, that we have uh, in, on Earth, and then the hydroxyl ion, and then ultimately, again, as I said, to water. So the most potent oxidizing agents, those we talk about, we talk about reactive oxygen, start with superoxide anion, which is actually a pretty um, weak oxidant, to the peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, which are extremely potent oxidants. What do oxidants do? Why do we care about them in aging? Well, they damage the three major macromolecules, DNA, lipid, and protein. DNA damage during aging, uh, you get uh, oxidants reacting with DNA itself, also with RNA, and that can produce mutations when it happens on the DNA chromatin uh, structure. That will, of course, inhibit DNA replication and, of course, transcription. And that also has been directly linked, these mutations, of course, DNA damage linked to reactive oxygen to cancer because of the mutations. Oxidants can also modify proteins themselves. This occurs because you're making a carbonyl group. So that carbonyl is the product of the oxidation reaction, which is on the polypeptide backbone. 
and carbonyl groups will of themselves alter or destroy protein activity and function. Okay, if it's an enzyme, we're talking about specific activity. So the carbonyl content of protein has been known to increase with age. That's shown down there in that graph. And as you get older, you increase the amount of uh, carbonyl content. So this is carbonyl here. And this is the product, again, of, ox of re uh, reactive oxygen um, reacting with polypeptide. And with a series of proteins here, that's what these different shapes are here. As you increase in age, you increase the amount of carbonyl content. Increasing the carbonyl content will decrease protein activity. That's what this is showing here. And multiple forms of protein can be oxidized. <clears throat> also, most important, very important, you get lipid peroxidation. That's a certain kind of oxidation, which we'll get into later. And that's the modification of lipids that are usually found in membranes, but it can also happen in the cytoplasm. That will again lead to differences and decreases in function. Lipid peroxidation is often uh, associated with increase in risk for atherosclerosis. We saw this, we talked about oxysterols, which was a previous um, uh, lecture. Uh, it's also negatively associated with lifespan. The more reactive oxygen associated with lipids making lipid peroxidation, the decrease in lifespan, which has been associated in animal model systems as well as in humans. And in fact, dietary restriction, caloric restriction tends to decrease lipid peroxidation. That is also associated with a decrease in uh, body mass index uh, and less obesity in the population. All of that can lead to decreases in lipid peroxidation and presumably increases in quality lifespan. Okay, so obviously oxidation is, plays a major role here. Now, I want to take a little drift uh, from our main frame discussion here and go to the literature, which is what we do at Veravmed. This is a paper that was published some time ago in Neuroscience Letters. The first time describing the antioxidant known as phenyl alpha terpbutyl nitrone shown here. Now you can also make a sulfide addict of this protein, excuse me, of this moiety, and that's used as an electron spin trap. So this is an antioxidant because this molecule will trap electrons. When you trap electrons, you decrease, you decrease the amount of oxidation. Okay, so this moiety here with this benzene ring associated with this double bond here, this carbon nitrogen bond, will allow for you to trap electrons. When you trap electrons, you act as an antioxidant. Now, one of the reasons PBN isn't used very often in humans is because it will spontaneously degrade to benzaldehyde, which is not a very good compound in the cell, and the n butyl hydroxylamine, well, both of which can have been shown to be carcinogenic. So we only look at this in model systems. However, take a look at this. Uh, before I get into the data on the bottom, which is going to be looking at that PBN, let me tell you that oxidative damage causes aging or senescence. Okay. Oxidative damage should increase with aging, and in fact, most types of oxidative damage do increase linearly or sometimes exponentially with increasing lifespan. A longer lifespan should correlate with low oxidant levels or maybe high antioxidants, and in feed, indeed, levels of serum peroxides in lab animals correlate with their lifespan. Higher levels of superoxide dismutase, which removes that superoxide that we just looked at, and uric acid, which is also associated with removing reactive oxygen, are associated with increased lifespan in rodents, okay, animal models. Third, experimental increases of antioxidants should slow down senescence, and here we're going to look at PBN, okay? Now, this is with rodents, not with humans, because I told you about the problem with PBN. Let's take a look here on this uh, first graph. There's carbonyl content that is an indication of protein oxidation on this y-axis. This is looking at PBN treatment. Here we're looking at control older gerbils. It's a gerbil study. Wow, cool, right? And they have a higher level of carbonyl than younger gerbils, right? Looks like about twice as much. Now, we're going to start increasing uh, the time given PBN, which is this antioxidant, the spin trap molecule I just showed you the structure of. Um, and as you increase the amount of time that you've added PBN, you see that you get a decrease in the amount of carbonyl content, okay? So by the time you get all the way over to here at day 14, 
you get about the same amount of carbonyl content in older gerbils. These are older gerbils now that you do in younger ones. So by adding the spin trap molecule, you've decreased the carbonyl content. Similar study done here. These are now looking at a behavioral response supposed to be indicative of the diminishment of cognitive ability in these animals, okay? And this is navigating a maze. You've heard of maze studies in animals. So these are error on the y-axis. This is errors of maze getting to the completion on the y-axis. And this, again, is looking at PBN activity in young versus old animals. So you have young saline. So saline means only the um, carrier was used. You see no decrease. No, no change in uh, uh, errors in maize running. Okay, that's the best you get. And there again, you add now the spin trap with the young animals. You don't have any effect, which you wouldn't expect because the carbonyl content shouldn't be altered. Next, you look at an old animal, right? And here you're adding just the carrier, the, the old saline. You see a whopping increase in errors in maize movement. But then when you add the PBN, the last bar on the histogram here, you see once again, you get a decrease in errors in maze navigation. So once again, it looks like from a behavioral response, decreasing the carbonyl content of the protein vis-a-vis -vis decreasing the amount of oxidant because of the spin trap PBN, you get a smarter gerbil even when they're older. All right, now eventually we have to determine whether or not this has anything to do with humans, and we will. So what is bi biological oxidation then? Let's define it. It involves the transfer of electrons. So oxidation is, terming, is termed as the removal of electrons, of course, and reduction is gaining electrons. Oxidation is always accompanied by a reduction. So you have a redox couple. Oxidation and reduction are coupled. And then when you have an oxidation of one molecule, you have the reduction of another, and that reduction of the other, that would be called the electron acceptor. Okay, that's the terminology we're gonna be using here. Aerobes, like us, we completely rely on molecular oxygen for uh, biological uh, energetics, for example, for producing our ATP because of oxidative phosphorylation. We call that respiration. And that's a process where cells, of course, derive their energy directly from the controlled reaction, which takes molecular oxygen all the way to water. So we're reducing molecular oxygen to water, okay? And those are one-step electron reduction processes. And along the way, we make those reactive oxygen moieties, right? Some of which can be quite toxic. Let's take a look at this. Oxidative phosphorylation, as I just said, process of producing energy. How do we do it? We take oxygen to water. We make ATP. That's oxidative phosphorylation. I've talked about it in other lectures. No doubt I've heard about this. Although that reaction is necessary for survival, it does produce those partially reduced forms of oxygen, which are not good. Okay, that's reactive oxygen, or ROS. So ROS, uh, uh, as shown to the structures a couple of slides ago, are highly reactive radicals. Radical just seem, simply means an unpaired electron, which means it's highly reactive, right? And it's produced uh, via that oxfos process. And it's potentially damaging because uh, as you increase the amount, you're going to increase, for example, the amount of car carbonyl and proteins. That increase in carbonyl and proteins is going to decrease protein uh, stability. Protein stability has been associated with aging. That is the decrease in stability. So there are detox enzymes, of course, in the cell, which will remove reactive oxygen. Here again, you're pumping electrons into molecular oxygen, superoxide, more electrons. You make hydrogen peroxide, you start introducing hydrogen ions. You make that all most important potent oxidizing molecule known as the hydroxyl radical shown there. Fortunately, it has a very short half-life and it gets reduced with more electrons and protons to water, okay? There are enzymes which can facilitate the removal of this reactive oxygen. One is superoxide dismutase, known as SOD. Uh, it takes two superoxides and hydrogen, and it produces hydrogen peroxide and back to molecular oxygen. Now, I told you this hydrogen peroxide itself is an, uh, is an oxidizing agent. We know this, of course, hydrogen peroxide. So we have to remove that. That's done by the catalase reaction. 
Catalase will take two hydrogen peroxide molecules and form water and oxygen. So there's no net, there's no net reactive oxygen for the catalase reaction. We've removed it all. You also have a third kind of reaction, which I've alluded to, that just involves lipids. So lipids here would be described as this reduced form of, say, a hydrocarbon, right? It's a hydrocarbon that are, are there. So hydrogen peroxide interacting with the hydrocarbon will then produce an oxidized hydrocarbon, such as an oxylipid, like oxysterol, for example, and water. So you've got a problem there because now you've produced a peroxide or peroxy radical which itself can produce via spontaneous chain reaction, more reactive oxygen species in biological molecules. So antioxidants, antioxidants, right? What those are, are those are molecules which reduce uh, oxidative species because they remove reactive oxygen. What are some typical antioxidants? Vitamin E, vitamin C, and glutathione. Okay, those are three common antioxidants in the cell. So that we talked a little bit now about <clears throat> reactive oxygen. Now let's talk about redox potential in more detail. Redox potential is the oxidation reduction potential. It is of any substance with, which has some affinity for electrons. So we have a redox for any organic compounds that have an affinity for electrons. In redox reactions, the free energy change is proportional to the tendency of reactants to donate or accept electrons. And this is denoted by a term known as E naught prime, which is also known as the cell potential. And that's what we discuss in biological systems and in fact in chemistry too. So a reaction with a positive value for the cell potential gives you a negative value for another term known as delta G. Now, we talked about delta G before in other lectures. That's basically the Gibbs free energy. When you have a negative delta G, you get a spontaneous or exergonic reaction. Therefore, a positive, because they're in reverse um, uh, or organization to each other, when you have a positive cell potential, you have a negative uh, free energy potential. A positive cell potential then means you have an exergonic or spontaneous reaction. This is how we follow electron transfer in oxfos and the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, for example. We can also discuss the cell potential within organic molecules, such as the, what is the cell potential of a sulfur-containing protein, right? So sulfur can, can exist in two forms in proteins as the reduced form as SH, or in the oxidized form as in SS. I'm going to get into that at the end of this lecture. So just keep that in mind. So the redox potential of a biological system is usually compared with the potential uh, against the potential of hydrogen electrodes. And that's always expressed at the pH of 7. Okay. So let's take a look now. We're going to do a little inorganic chemistry, as I threatened. If we look at these react, uh, these redox reactions, here we're looking at iron and copper. So you have Fe2 plus copper 2, those oxidation states, going to Fe3, that was an oxidation, going to copper plus 1, that was a reduction. So that can actually be expressed as two half reactions, or we call them half cells. Here, let's look at the iron uh, half reaction. Fe2 going to Fe3 plus plus an electron, that's an oxidation. Here, we would say that Fe2 is the reducing agent. The other half cell is copper 2 plus an electron going to copper 1. That's the reduced form. So therefore, copper 2 plus would be the oxidizing agent by definition in this redox nomenclature. The reducing agent is, where elect is the electron donating molecule, and the oxidizing agent is always the electron accepting always the electron accepting molecule. Together they make a conjugate redox pair. So let's go more into electrochemistry uh, because we need to do that so that you're not ambiguous about what we mean when we talk about redox potential. So let's go into detail here. You have something called the electrochemical cell. We just looked at that with the copper iron. Let's go into now more an abstract discussion. Electrochemical cell is a device which converts an electrical energy into chemical energy or vice versa. You have two types, therefore. You have the electrolytic cell, 
That converts the electrical energy into chemical energy. And electricity then is used to drive a non-spontaneous reaction. That's an electrolytic cell. That's opposed to a galvanic or voltaic cell, which converts the chemical energy into electricity. That basically is your battery, like in your car. So that's a spontaneous reaction and it produces electricity, okay? Now, conduction is another thing that we need to at least bring up here. Metals or metallic ions, they give you electronic conduction and that's a free movement of electrons. And that's different from an electrolytic or solution-based ionic conduction. You can also use molten salts, by the way. And that's a free movement of ions. Of course, there's gonna be electronically uh, charged species, right, of specific elements, right? So because there's a difference between the kind of chemistry, the galvanic cell, the cathode is reduction and the anode is oxidation. And that's reversed in the electrolytic cell where the anode is oxidation and the cathode is reduction. Okay, so sometimes people get confused about that with electrochemistry, but it's just simply because you're looking at the two opposing reactions as we just discussed. So we have to make sure we always have the correct summary of cell descriptions. So for example, here it is looking at a galvanic cell, copper and silver. You see the anode is the copper solid, copper two plus aqueous, and the cathode is going to be the silver aqueous and the silver solid, okay? That's gonna be your cathode. Now, let's go into more detail here. Let's discuss redox reactions. Back to this at the inorganic chemistry level. Redox reactions are those which describe the transfer of electrons between species. Means that one species will always be oxidized and one will always be reduced. And most importantly, the two processes will occur together, simultaneously in fact, although we can separate them when we're making batteries, for example. Or we can also separate them in a long chain of reactions, such as the electron transport chain in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Now, when has a redox reaction occurred? How do we know this? If there is a change in the oxidation state of any element in the reaction, you have a redox reaction. Remember that if something is oxidized, something else has to be reduced and vice versa. For example, calcium solid plus molecular oxygen, a gas, will make calcium oxide a solid. That's a redox reaction. Likewise, aluminum and chloride. Aluminum is a solid, chlorine is a gas, will form aluminum chloride, which is a solid. That's also a redox reaction. Why? Why do we know that? Because something's being oxidized and something's being reduced, okay? Now, let's go back to cell potentials. This is important for the last part of the talk, which I'm going to move quickly towards, so don't worry. Cell potential then is the E naught of the cell that generates an electron motive force or EMF. Units of a cell potential are in volts, and in scientific nomenclature, one volt is equivalent to one joule coulomb. The uh, a cell potential is a measure of the relative spontaneity of a cell reaction. So if you have a positive cell potential, as we said, spontaneous reaction. What does the cell potential depend on? Nature of the reactants, what's the chemistry? The temperature, but when you give you a su sub superscript of that that degree sign, that means it's always at 25 degrees. So that's gonna be standard conditions. Likewise, when that superscript is there with the prime, it means you're gonna have concentrations all at one molar. So that's gonna be a standard cell potential from which we will deviate according to changes in reactants and changing in concentrations, changing in temperatures, right? So the E naught prime of the cell is independent of the amounts of reactants when we describe that as the standard condition. So let's use this, okay? An equation with more positive cell potential value reverses a less positive one. Let's take a look. Let's look at tin solid reacting with copper aqueous, making now tin aqueous copper solid. Let's split it into two F reactions like we've been doing. Copper in the aqueous phase plus two electrons is going to make copper the solid. 
tin in the solid is going to make tin aqueous plus two electrons. Those are your two F reactions. Let's now find or deduce the electrode potentials, making these usual equations. What are they? Copper in the aqueous phase plus two electrons is going to make copper solid. What's going to be the cell potential there? It's going to be a positive, we know what that means, spontaneous, of 0.34 volt. Okay, I'm not using the joule coulomb here. I'm, I'm just because it's inorganic chemistry. Um, the tin in aqueous plus two electrons is going to make tin the solid. And that's going to give us a cell, cell uh, reaction of negative 0.14. Okay, so that's obviously not going to be spontaneous. So in order for this to work, in order for that above reaction there to be spontaneous, we're going to have to reverse one of the equations. We're going to reverse the one that has the lower E naught. Okay. So that means we're going to say that the tin solid is going to go to the tin aqueous plus two electrons. Now we've flipped the sign because we want that reaction to be spontaneous. If we combine now those two reactions, we're going to say tin solid, plus copper aqueous is going to make tin aqueous plus copper solid, just like we started with at the beginning. We add now those two E naughts. We have a positive 0 0.34, a positive 0 0.14. We end up now with a positive 0.48 volt. That will be a spontaneous reaction. This reaction, as described there, will go spontaneously. Okay, so the tin solid will become tin and aqueous, make the ion. And the copper aqueous will now become, we're going to make some copper metal, okay, some copper solid. Okay. Now, what about biological uh, systems? We've talked now about inorganic chemistry. Hopefully, I've explained sufficiently at some level what redox means. Let's now take our new uh, knowledge and use it in biological systems. Here, we're not going to be looking at iron or copper, but we could, right, because those are definitely embedded in biology. But here I want to talk about sulfur. And we're going to talk specifically about a huge paradigm in protein stabilization. That's when you have two SH groups, those are known as sulfhydryls, which we obtain from the R group of cysteine amino acids. The cysteine amino acid R group is an SH. We're going to go from two SHs to a disulfide. That's the SS bond. The disulfide is part of the primary structure of proteins. And when you make a disulfide, you stabilize the protein. That's what happens to it, okay? So here's a paper published now some, oh, six years ago, not quite. It was in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, one of my absolute favorite journals, of course, JBC. Now, what is this paper discussing? It's discussing the reduction potential. That's the E naught. We just determined, we know what E naught means. We can talk about reduction potential now of active site del sulfides within a protein. And the protein we're going to talk about is the human protein disulfide isomerase, or PDI, the PDI, okay? Now, that reduction potential of the active disulfides embedded in that protein is going to limit, okay, and be limited by the, uh, its own oxidation by another enzyme, which is coupled to the SH to SS bond in the PDI, that is in the isomerase. That second enzyme is going to be called arrow-1-alpha. So you're going to have basically a total of three proteins involved here. You're going to have a substrate protein, which is going to be reacted upon by the protein disulfide isomerase. Then you're going to have the protein disulfide isomerase acted upon by the arrow one, which is going to reform the disulfide because you're going to basically reduce it when you oxidize the SH groups in the substrate protein. And then ultimately, you're going to have to get back the correct form of the arrow R1, and we're going to do that by transferring electron electrons out. We'll see how that happens. We're going to make basically hydrogen peroxide in the process. Okay. So this will be linked to reactive oxygen, of course. So what are we talking about here? Reversible cysteine disulfide formation is often essential for the stabilization of proteins that are secreted from the cell. What kind of proteins? A common secreted protein is an immunoglobulin. 
Does it, ha does it have disulfides? You betcha. So you must make that disulfide bridge in that protein. When is it made? Well, where's the protein made? Proteins that are going to be routed to the secretion uh, pathway, secretory pathway, are going to start in the ER. They're going to move, move through the Golgi. They're going to make it to the plasma membrane and ultimately going to be released into the extracytoplasmic space. So that's what we're talking about in terms of cellular trafficking here. Okay. The protein disulfide formation, which is going to be involved as protein disulfide isomerase or PDI, plus the resolving enzymatic activity of the arrow one, that's going to, and both of those enzymes are going to be found in this subcellular machinery in the ER to Golgi to plasma membrane. Okay, that's where you're going to be having these reactions. Okay. Okay. This 2SH, that's two cysteines redu reduced form, are going to require reoxidation. That's reoxidation of those 2SHs, which you left behind in the PDI via the arrow one. It's going to undergo an internal disulfide exchange, ultimately passing its electrons to molecular oxygen. Yeah, just like we saw at the beginning of this lecture. You're going to form hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, that's a reactive oxygen. And that's going to be involving an enzyme bound flavin adenine dinucleotide. Now, what is that? That's going to be what? An electron acceptor. It's going to become FADH2. It's going to get reduced. And ultimately, then that is going to do what? It's going to reduce molecular oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. See, the couple completes itself, okay? Always a redox couple. Here it is. The electron transfer system provides for the passage of electrons from the substrate protein to molecular oxygen via the PDI, that's the protein disulfide isomerase, and the ARR1, that's the resolving enzyme, that results in the formation of disulfide in a secreted protein with a concomitant reduction of molecular oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. Now, there is the uh, website uh, uh, for you uh, to be able to obtain this paper to look at this entire description of the PDI arrow R1 as described in that journal. Take a look. You start off with two di uh, sulfhydryl groups, two S SH groups, and two cysteine residues. You're going to make the disulfide bridge. That protein now is going to be ready for what? Secretion. In that process, you're going to take the oxidized form of the PDI, okay, and you're going to reduce it, right? So now you're going to be left with two SHs, right? Now that protein needs to be reoxidized. It's going to be reoxidized by the disulfide generating enzyme known as arrow one. Then you're going to start off with it being oxidized, it being reduced. You're going to pass those electrons from the reduced uh, protein disulfide isomerase to the oxidized form, so it can now repeat this reaction, making the disulfide in the substrate protein. That RR1 now is reduced. It's going to go through that FAD moiety bound in that enzyme, actually, that flavonatine dinucleotide, not shown in this particular slide here, but ultimately it's going to pass those electrons to molecular oxygen and you're going to make hydrogen peroxide. That's the complete couple, right? SH to SS. You're going to go from oxidized PDI to reduced, back to oxidized via going from oxidized ROR1 to reduced. You're going to reoxidize that so it can, what, oxidize the PDI, which can then oxidize the SH groups by adding those electrons directly to molecular oxygen, which is an excellent electron acceptor, making this H2O2. Okay, so there's the whole process. Now, here's a paper published just recently in a journal, a Japanese journal called Oncotarget. It's uh, open access, and there is the website for it. Uh, the, there is a link for it. What's this paper? This is the most recent one we're going to talk about today. Cancer-associated oxidoreductase, arrow R1 alpha, that's a subunit form, promotes immune escape through upregulation of the protein disulfide isomerase form L1 in human breast cancer. Now, what does immune escape mean? It means that this error R1 is going to be a bad actor here, a bad actor because it's going to promote immune escape. Ultimately, we'll see what that means, but it's going to involve the lymphocytes T cells. Okay, so T cells 
are going to be involved in this system where Arrow R1 is going to be faithfully carrying out this disulfide redox reaction. But in so doing, it's going to be a bad actor because it's going to be causing an ablation of T cells. This particular ablation of T cells is actually going to promote breast cancer, okay? Because the T cells normally here, cytotoxic T cells in particular, are going to be what? They're going to be destroying the tumor. What tumor? The breast cancer tumor. If we don't have these T cells functioning correctly, which is not going to happen because of this disulfide uh, reaction, then what you're going to end up with is a proliferation of the uh, ductal carcinoma. So let's take a look. Here is full change in the uh, protein disulfide isomerase, okay? That, that is the actual full change in the activity of the enzyme. Here's a mock transformation. Here's three cell types. So let me just take some discussion of what this means. These three cell types here have been uh, transformed with a vector which causes an overexpression of that disulfide resolving enzyme, the arrow one alpha. So each of these cell lines here are making more of this protein than a mock transformation. Mock transformation simply means you've transformed cells without that insert, the insert being the gene for error R1, the human gene in this case. So what happens when you increase the amount of arrow R1? You are increasing the activity of that protein disulfide isomerase. So we already know that because we know what that couple is from that previous paper we looked at from 2010, that JBC paper, right? This is a current paper, 2017. Now take a look at this. Sort of not what you might expect, but science is always what you don't expect, right? There's always uncertainty in science. Here on the y-axis, what we're looking at is the relative abundance of messenger RNA for that protein disulfide isomerase. That means transcriptional increase. That means an increase in the net amount of that polypeptide, of that PDI enzyme, okay? So your fresh transcription ultimately going to be translated to the polypeptide. Now, look at this. Dig this. Same thing over here. You're looking on the x-axis, you're looking at the three different cell lines, and as it turns out, they are statistically increasing multiple fold. Here is a two-fold increase, here is a four-fold increase, and in this cell line, a whopping six-fold increase in the transcription of that protein disulfide isomerase when you increase the amount of expression of the arrow R1. Right? So now we're looking at some other thing, and we're looking at transcriptional activation. Is arrow R1 directly doing this? As it turns out, no. Uh, in data, I'm not going to show you, but what this paper does in great detail and very faithfully, and I recommend you read the paper by going to the open access, you're going to get transcription by a transcription factor called HIF1-alpha. HIF1-alpha is basically the uh, hypoxia-inducible factor, transcription factor. So when you induce hypoxia, you induce the expression of that disulfide isomerase. Now, why would that be? Because you're protecting the cells. You're protecting the cells because of this change in oxidizing environment. Now, in so doing, as it turns out, you're going to be affecting T cells, which are ultimately going to be affecting this breast cancer. Okay, so now we're going to get to that. Okay, now this is now at the protein level. On the left here is a Western blot. I want you to look at in non-reducing conditions, that is in a gel that's been run, polyacrylamide gel, and then a Western transfer on their nitrocellulose. You're looking at the reduced forms and the oxidized forms of that protein disulfide isomerase. And you see that in the mock, you have hardly no uh, enzyme, very low levels, very low sum there, of course. But as you look at the overexpressing of the arrow R1, remember that's what we're looking at, we're overexpressing arrow R1, you're looking at the fact that you're getting both the reduced and the oxidized forms of that enzyme. Both the reduced and the oxidized form of that enzyme in non-reducing conditions, okay? Now, when you run the gel under reducing conditions, that means you're using dithyl 3 at all in the gel or beta mercaptoethanol, you get a different thing. You get all of that protein in the reduced form, all of it in the reduced form. That shows you that reducing the protein does what you expect it to do, 
you make it all reduced, okay? That tells you that the nascent production of the protein doesn't give you the reduced form. You need reducing conditions. The beta actin here is a control protein, just letting you know that it doesn't change upon uh, any of this transformation activity. You've introduced this error R1, there's no effect on a stably expressed protein, and this one's beta actin. Often you set a skeletal protein beta actin for this kind of study. Now, what happens when we just looked at the relative amount of oxidized versus reduced form of that PD protein, okay? Of that protein um, disulfide isomerase protein. So remember the oxidized form is going to be the form which is going to what? It's going to oxidize the substrate protein, right? So it's gonna be the active form of the PDI, right? And indeed, what you see here is with all three of the transformed cell lines, you get an increase in the form of oxidized versus reduced. So in other words, you're in the right state of that polypeptide to carry on that phenomena where you're gonna take the SH groups of the substrate proteins, whatever they happen to be, making disulfide bridges just like you would have expected to happen. So that means under reducing, what this data shows, under reducing conditions, the protein disulfide isomerase is in the SH form and it's found only in cells or mostly much more of it in cells where you have that arrow R1 con construct, you have much less of it when the mock transformation, you just have basal activity. In vivo, there is more oxidized form, that's the right-hand graph here, than the reduced form. That's going to favor the disulfide formation in the target substrate protein, which is exactly what you would expect to happen with this PDI arrow alpha complex redox. So let's put this together here. Arrow 1 alpha plays an important role in the expression, that means transcription here, of the protein disulfide isomerase. And that's via the facilitation of an oxidized protein folding, which we saw because of that redox potential in those gels, we saw that. And the upregulation, actually, of the transcription. And again, what I didn't show you to simplify matters for this paper, that was via a transcriptional activator, transcription factor known as HIF1 alpha. That's the epoxy inducible factor 1 alpha. That's the transcription factor, not error R1. Error R1, though, induces it. Now, here's the key point down regulation of the protein disulfide isomerase expression by knocking down the arrow R1, this was done by knockdown, okay, by actually using an interfering RNA, resulted in decreased protein disulfide isomerase induced apoptosis of T cells. I know that's a real head full, right? What I'm basically saying is that you get these overexpressing lines, R1, you're getting a lot more PDI, getting a lot more PDI through the HIF1 alpha transcription. But when you knock down R1, this is just a proof of concept. When you knock it back down in those cell lines, you get decreased protein disulfide isomerase. And that is what's actually linked to, the activity of that enzyme is linked to apoptosis apoptosis of T cells, which is a bad thing. You want those cytotoxic T cells in this breast cancer system, right? Yeah, because they're going to attack the carcinoma. They're going to attack the ductal carcinoma. So perhaps, this is what the take-home message here from this paper is, brand new paper just published a month or two ago, a pharmaceutical target in breast cancer tumor cell, you know, maybe in humans, should be maybe the error R1 because it's mitigating, right, this in increase in the protein disulfide isomerase, which itself is causing, or at least highly correlated, to this diminution or ablation via apoptosis of T cells, all of which leads to an increase in the breast cancer, okay, the severity of the breast cancer. So the targeting could enhance could enhance by, by targeting, getting rid of that, T cell mediated tumor cell killing, at least in the mouse model that we were looking at here. 
maybe that can be ultimately transferred to human. So what's the summary here of this paper? T cell ablation via apoptosis as induced by protein disulfide exchange mediated via the protein disulfide isomerase uh, induced activation by arrow R1 through HIF1 alpha is associated with increased breast cancer severity. Okay, so obviously, if you knock out R1, you're going to decrease the increase in expression of this protein disulfide isomerase, which seems to be the one mitigating this bad increase in uh, breast cancer severity. All right, so thanks a lot. Uh, I'm about ready to be finished here on this uh, hopefully shortened version of my lectures. I'm going to continue on with reactive oxygen, so please stay tuned. There's my email address, info at verevmed.com. Uh, our website, www.verevmed. Again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra, and it's been a pleasure giving you this lecture today. Remember that Verev Med, what we do is we are scientists, and we take a look at the literature for you, and we verify published evidence in the medical and biomedical fields, right? So what we do is we take a look at that literature, we, we tear it apart, we examine your particular questions and uh, for the topic that you're interested in, we look at a lot of different papers and we come up with um, a verification of that evidence so that we can move forward with your particular interest. Thanks a lot for paying attention.